Welcome back to Global Media Network, LLC. Passionate World Talk Radio is a wholly owned subsidiary of GMN LLC. And today, July 21st, we're starting a new series on human trafficking, which includes a lot of different sub genres within the main category of human trafficking. And that's what we're going to be dealing with this month and part of August, unless we forget hyphen historical. If you're wondering why we have a hyphen historical, it is because lest we forget is a very popular name for different types of groups to use. And I do not want our podcast with Lisa Skinner, Betsy Wurzel, and Lillian Caldwell to not be visible to its audience. So I added hyphen historical. I got the idea from iTunes, which also uses hyphen historical on all the podcasts that air on iTunes. So starting out will be Lisa Skinner. Lisa? Hi, everybody. Welcome back to our show. So happy to have you here with us. So as Lillian mentioned, we are starting a new series today, and I'm going to take us all back to the history of slavery in the U.S. And some of the information that I uncovered is extraordinary. So I hope you find this as fascinating as I did. Slavery in the United States existed from the period of colonial America in the early 17th century until the events of the American Civil War, which lasted from 1861 to 1865. Throughout this time frame, many slaves were brought from Africa to the territory of the United States via the Atlantic slave trade. The Atlantic slave trade began in the mid 15th century, reached its peak in the 18th century and concluded near the end of the 19th century. During the time of the Atlantic slave trade, approximately 12 million Africans were put on these slave ships, sailed across the Atlantic Ocean and sold into slavery. In fact, approximately 600,000 African slaves were brought to the United States as part of the Atlantic slave trade, which amounts to about 5% of the total number of slaves from that time. Many of these slaves ended up working on plantations and households across the United States and played a significant role in the production of certain goods. This was especially true in the Southern states, as we all know from the Civil War uh, information and that uh, you know, exists throughout our history, where these plantations were very common. On a plantation, the slaves were used to harvest crops and carry out other tasks. Throughout the time frame of slavery in the United States, the most common crops that were harvested on the plantations were cotton, rice, indigo, and tobacco. These crops were especially labor intensive and as such, African slave labor made the most economical sense for many of these plantation owners. As well, these crops were cash crops. In other words, they were focused on producing crops for sale instead of for their own consumption. So slavery in the United States grew particularly powerful during the time frame of the late 18th century until the outbreak of the Civil War in 1861. This was most popular, again, in the southern states, where slavery was commonly used on agricultural plantations. This time period is often referred to as the antebellum period. 
Though slavery in America, in America has long since been illegal in the United States, however, as Lillian and Betsy will tell you today, it is still thriving and one of the most um, economically profitable businesses that exist today. So they're going to be discussing how this has progressed and what's going on with it today. The ramifications of the African slave trade almost broke our new nation. And the, this situation is still felt throughout American society, politics, and culture today. While the rest of the world had long engaged in the forced servitude of people throughout the history, America was introduced to the first African slaves by Dutch merchants way back in 1619, which spiraled into more than 200 years of economic reliability on slaves. Now, this is where it gets really interesting because I was not personally aware of this. The enslavement of Africans in the New World was just one faction of slavery in America with the forced servitude of Native Americans throughout the American Southwest and California also being present. Now, you remember, uh, a month or so back, we did an entire series on the genocide of the Native American population in the US. I did a lot of research on that topic and I did not read anything about Native Americans also being enslaved. And it turns out they were. So they were forced into servitude throughout the American Southwest and California. And it resulted or partially resulted in the genocide of many Native Americans throughout the territories. So slavery was actually a huge part of their literal disappearance. Many people may incorrectly believe that the enslavement of Africans was America's only abuse of slavery. But the first use of slavery in the Americans came with the Spanish conquerors when they settled in Mexico, California, and what is today known as the American Southwest, and was also used frequently throughout the American Southeast as well. As early as 1542, when Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo, a Spanish explorer, claimed the California territories for Spain. The forced servitude of Native Americans resulted as many of the soldiers used Native free labor to help build battlements, forts, and Catholic missions. Then throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, Missions throughout Mexico and the southwestern United States captured the native Californians, baptized them as Catholics, and then forced them to work in different missions around Spain's extended empire. While many missions started, they would release the natives who worked as planters, masons, cattle herders, carpenters, and more after a decade of servitude but often this never happened. The Southern colonies of the United States were equally responsible with their large plantations and they required massive amounts of labor. Paired with the poor treatment of the slaves, there was always a need for more hands and bodies to do that backbreaking work. In many cases, the colonies in the Southeast had more Native American slaves than African slaves prior to the years of the American Revolution due to the fact they were cheaper and easier to get than the African slaves because the African slaves obviously had to be shipped here from Africa 
which was more expensive once they reached the Americas. In fact, the trade of slaves with Native Americans was very popular in the southeastern colonies, which colonists trading labor for goods and weapons in return for other natives that had been captured during battles and sieges. Some Native Americans were then traded to the Caribbeans, where they were um, less likely to run away. Now, the, Afri the Native Americans proved, and this is where the big change came in, the Native Americans proved to be less reli reliable, less physically capable, and less able to adapt and live to the harsh working conditions of slavery, which in conjunction with the profitable economy for cotton, tobacco, and other agricultural trades in the South led now to the increase of African slaves, the African slave trade. So this is where the big change came in. The slave trade in America as we know it today was not an immediate institution, but one that evolved as the economies and social constructs changed with the times. Massachusetts became the first colony to legalize slavery in 1641, but it wasn't until 1654 that a black indentured servant who was legally bound to his master for life rather than a designated time that could be finished, like we just heard with the Native Americans. Now, since the colonies were dictated by English law and loosely by European law, there was little understanding of how to deal with African or black citizens as they were generally considered foreigners and outside of the English common law which was the reigning governing law at the time. Unlike America, Britain had no procedure in place for accepting immigrants. And it wasn't until 1662 that Virginia adopted a new law to address the subject of immigrant and natural born Americans of non-white parentage. Known as the principle of partis sequitur ventrum, English law stated that any generations born into the colony were forced to take the social position of the mother, thereby claiming that any children born of slave mother was born a slave, whether a Christian or not, and subject to enslavement for life. What was peculiar about this law was its objection to English common law in that children born are required to take the status of the father. And it created many problems for slave women for more than a century. With white men not needing to take responsibility of their children, decades of abuse between owner and slaves resulted in mixed race children and infinite scandals. In 1705, Virginia enacted what was called their slave codes. In Virginia, slaves were people that were imported from non-Christian countries. However, the colonists still considered Native American slaves due to the fact that they were not Christian. The final aspect of slave daily life was the enforcement of the slave codes. Slave codes were laws that set out the rules for slaves in the United States. And in general, these slave codes of the time limited the actions that a slave could take. For example, one such rule was that slaves were not allowed to leave the slave owner's property unless they were joined by a white person. The slave codes also had harsh punishments for slaves that tried to escape. This included whippings, brandings with, with actual branding irons, and even the death penalty. Slaves were also banned from owning weapons, and they were punished if they were 
found to have stolen any items. In all, the slave codes attempted to control the daily life and activities of slaves in the United States. 30 years later, Georgia prohibited slavery throughout the colony, the only one out of the 13 colonial states and continued to prohibit it until 1750 when the colony authorized slavery stating that it was unable to meet production demands on the numbers of indentured servants alone. Now, Louisiana, which was not an English colony, if you remember, it was owned by the French, was under the rule of the French Code Noir, which already regulated the institution of slavery throughout France's other conquests, including the Caribbean and New France. The regulations, however, were somewhat different than those of the English. Under French law, so in Louisiana, slaves were allowed to marry. They were considered inseparable after a union was made and children were not allowed to be separated from their mothers. Although punishment of slaves in certain circumstances was systematically harsh, there were far more free people of color throughout Louisiana than in any other areas, states, colonies, territories in the Americas. In Louisiana, the, the, the slaves were often business owners, were educated, or even held their own slaves. But under the law, which still differentiated between black and white, people of mixed race were still considered black. After the Louisiana Purchase, the slaves in Louisiana lost these freedoms and were denied the rights they had under the French rule. While slave, slavery in the North did exist, it was much less agriculturally oriented and more domestic. Many slaves in the Northern colonies were maids, butlers, cooks, and um, assigned other household roles. Though the number can't be exactly placed, Historians believe that as many as 7 million Africans were transported from their native home to the U.S. states throughout the 1700s, despite many colonists feeling strongly against slavery. And if not strongly against slavery, they were at least in favor of emancipation due to the fear of slavery revolts. In 1775, one year prior to America's independence, the governor of Virginia proposed freeing the slaves of the colony in return that they fight for the British. So some 1,500 slaves who were owned by American patriots left their masters to fight for the British. And 300 of them are said to have made it to freedom back in England. Under the proclamation, however, the slaves owned by loyalists were not freed and remained in servitude. Many more slaves used the general disruption of the war to escape, running to the north, to the west, escaping from their captors, while battles raged on around them. For those who fought for the British, around 20,000 freed slaves were taken to freedom to Canada the Caribbean, and to England. While the war raged in the colonies, British became the dominant international slave trader, and the American government forbade the importation of more foreign slaves, although later, after the turn of the century, due to the economic reliance on slaves on the plantations, um, such as the tobacco plantations, rice, indigo. The trade was once again opened in Georgia and in South Carolina. Though the North was well on its way to industrialization, the South was a robust agricultural economy 
one that made the thought of slavery as an illegal practice in the new country a pipe dream. For there was one plant in particular that would change the slave trade in America forever. What do you think that was? Cotton. 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 Those who say that America was built on the backs of slaves harvesting cotton are a lot closer to the truth than they think. After the fields of the 13 colonies were picked dry of nutrients for growing tobacco and the English textile industries picked up, the huge demand for American cotton meant a huge demand for slaves. Prior to 1793, the process of separating cotton from its seed was tiresome and time-consuming task done by hand by the slaves. Cotton was extremely profitable, but not as much as it could be. Then Eli Whitney, who was a young school teacher from the North, invented the cotton gin a machine that was able to separate the seed from the cotton ball. And the lives of Americans changed almost overnight with the advent of the cotton gin. No longer were slaves required to sort cotton, but the demand for more and more crop and the work of a cotton gin increased the country's dependency on slaves. So instead of cutting down on the slave trade, it more than doubled the need for slavery. Here we go. As America moved into the 19th century, abolitionism took reins in the North. A movement designed to end slavery, the support above the Mason-Dixon line was overwhelming and thoroughly angelical. Considered a peculiar institution among contemporaries, though, slavery, slavery was seen as a necessary evil to keep up with the demands of the international cotton trade, at least from a ruling perspective. No one wanted to upset the fragile balance of the new democracy or wreak the thriving economy that was building out of it. Not only did the drive for more cotton increase the domestic slave trade in the US, but it also incurred a second side effect, migration of slaves out West. Dubbed the second middle passage, it was a defining moment of the 19th century and the resounding event between the American Revolution and the Civil War. During this time, many slaves lost their families, their ethnicity and historical identity as communities were broken up, traded across slaves and moved out west. Whippings, hangings, mutilation, torture, beating, burning and branding were just a few of the punishments and cruelties shown to slaves by their slaveholders. And while conditions varied throughout the South, the harsh conditions were fueled by the fear of rebellion and the slave codes based on colonial area law. Did this defined the relationships between slave and master with the master hardly ever being prosecuted for wrongdoing. They managed through terror and fear. So, I've led you up to the um, Civil War, the beginning of the Civil War and the abolition period. Uh, we are going to do several episodes on this topic. So next week, I will continue with um, some of the history of slaves during the Civil War and what their daily lives were like. So stay tuned for that. Uh, and now I will turn the um, floor over to Lillian. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I used two URLs to help me put basic statistics of current human trafficking 
in the world, not just in the United States. One of actually both sides encourage you to make a difference and to contact them and find out how you can help. In fact, both organizations that I use for reference tell you what you can do to help them to prevent human trafficking to become more than the billion dollar business that it already is. So I'm going to provide you with some information. And when I close it out, I will, will be giving you a quote from a well-known lady who runs Freedom Walk or Walk to Freedom and associated with the country Australia and also a quote of what commercial sex and labor is all about so you can understand what not only Lisa Skinner is talking about. This is not implying these things happened. These things are still going on. You need to be aware of it. Did you know that 27% of the traffic, human trafficking are children alone? A lot of them are concerned with forced labor. So what is forced labor? It is fraud, coercion, or to get a victim to provide labor or services for free for their masters. Think of a pimp who is in charge of a bevy of young women. He finds homeless on the street. They need to eat. They're forced into prostitution. They turn their tricks and they give their money over to their master. This is the same description of what happens to these children. Whatever money they earn are given to the masters who own them. There's always a master and there's always a slave. More than two thirds of children fall into forced labor, including more than 10 million adults and nearly 4 million children are concerned and make up the illegal trafficking and it generates $150 billion per year. And we're not talking about just the Western nations that have the majority of the wealth in this universe. We are talking about worldwide. Specifically, 51.8 billion in the US and in the Asia Pacific area. So think about that as well, that the United States, thankfully, if you want to look at it that way, isn't the only culprit who is making billions of dollars off the flesh of women and children. Now, these statistics are from the World Children Organization. So look them up. They have a help section in which you can click on and they will tell you how you can help. Yes, this is a call to action because you don't know if your child who just ran away may become part of this statistics. You don't know if you're a child who maybe broke the law and is afraid to go home, remains with friends who may be just roaming the streets at night, sleeping in parks, sleeping in the malls, because they go after displaced people. Take a look at the runaway numbers just in the United States. It made my blood run cold. And I assure you that it will make your blood run cold as well. Children are more likely to be trafficked. 
they're taken from their families over in Asia and they're forced into labor to perform domestic duties in a household or they work in agriculture or factories. Remember the destitute conditions of the factories in the US during the early 1900s with child labor and how they finally managed to pass laws protecting these children. Well, think about children today in the 21st century who are not protected by those child laws when they work in these factories or they go out into the field. You've listened to the African-Americans who are descendants of great grandparents who were slaves. You heard the horrors that Lisa Skinner just introduced. And here we are, ladies and gentlemen, in the 21st century, and these same horrors are still going on with women and children. Do you think these children will have children who will carry on what happened to them? There's an estimated 168 million children laborers worldwide. So there's no labor shortage in the human trafficking world. Not like the United States that can't find enough educated people to take the jobs who don't want to work in an office or don't have the skills that say the blue collar workers previously held because nobody wants to do work like that and get their hands dirty. And yet in the human traffickers, they have all that covered. What is known as a hazardous world is when children are in danger physically, emotionally, socially, and mentally. 66% of the children who are trafficked are girls. I heard a story from a previous host who told me she lived down in San Diego and Two or three weeks after living down there, the police raided the home and they found a young nine-year-old girl living there who was being prostituted to bring in money for the family that owned her. But nobody would ever tell because she was dressed like any other child and they saw her taking out the garbage and it never occurred to any of them that this child did not belong to this household. Around the world, girls are forced to drop out of school or they're denied access to generate income. And as a result, they're also socially abandoned. And this makes it a lot better and offers greater opportunities for these children to be snatched. And as a result, with their lack of education, they grow older and they have no way of providing a living for themselves. And many of these girls have children at 13 and 14. In in Western Europe during the Middle Ages, children, girls were married at 12 years old. And a lot of these girls were being forced into marriages against their will or a lot younger. Ninety-nine percent of the victims trafficked are considered sexually exploitation of women and girls. The traffickers use threats, debt bondage, lies, and coercion to force these kids to engage in commercial sex acts against their will. 
young girls living on the streets or from poor families are more vulnerable to this kind of trafficking. As stated before, countries affected by trafficking are the Asian Pacific region where one in every 250 people are victims. And seven in 10 victims are trafficked in Asia Pacific. Now, you're probably wondering, well, how do these traffickers get these girls? Well, they go to villages, especially ones that they do their homework or research. Like a bank robber, they case the joint and I find out which villagers have the most improvised families where the girls are not adequately provided for. So in the first case, they go in and they say to young mothers who are 15, 16, companies are hiring young women like you and you'll get a great salary, you'll be given clothes, a place to live, and you can start earning money and you can send some of it back to your parents and keep enough to live on. Or they go into a village and they approach a poor family and say, we're looking for marriageable girls. We have great husbands for them. And the best part of the deal is you don't need a dowry. The men will take them without a dowry. And for these uneducated people, this is gold to them. And a lot of the parents will actually force their young girls or teenage girls to accept these lies that the traffickers are telling them. Once they have the girls in their clutches, they sell them to a brothel. And if the girl doesn't perform, they're either used for commercial sex, which is prostitution, or they're beaten, and worse, they are raped. So that is the fate of many of these young girls who are given with permission from the parents for a better life. And that's how they become engaged in human trafficking. Now, the next source I went to was from the Catholic News Agency. And you can also look them up. And according to them, the report that they had was written by Kevin J. Jones. And this is what he found out. That human trafficking is made up of sexual exploitation, forced labor, and modern day slavery. In his report, he finds that 27.6 million people worldwide are subjected to forced labor. In the report, forced labor and forced marriage that was released in September, 2022, was authored by the International Labor Organization for Migration and the Australian-based human rights advocacy group, Walk Free Foundation. They report that 17.3 billion are trafficked and their victims are forced labor exploitation. 6.3 million victims of commercial sex, which is again, prostitution. 3.3 million children are subjected to forced labor. Half of these children are sexually exploited for commercial gain. According to them on global slavery, 28 million people are subject to forced labor. 22 million are forced marriage. And most of them are prevalent in the Arab states. And many of these children have the support of their families because they firmly believe that the family member that they're giving to these traffickers are going to improve their life and the life of the family. 
Who do these people prey on? Women, migrants, refugees, and other people in crisis are affected. It's estimated that 50 million people, one in 150, are living in modern day slavery. In 2021, it was only, excuse me, in 2016, it was only 40 million people. Grace Forrest, the founding director of Walk Free said, and I quote, modern slavery permeates every aspect of our society. It is woven through our clothes, lights up our electronics, and seasons our food. At its core, modern slavery is a manifestation of extreme inequality. It is a mirror held to power reflecting who may give society and who does not. In other words, it's the have nots that are more affected by this type of slavery than it is from the wealthier countries. Nowhere is this paradox more present than in our global economy through transitional supply chains. And you're probably wondering what they consider modern slavery. And modern slavery is the exploit, exploitive situations in which a person cannot refuse or leave due to threats, violence, coercion, or deception. It includes forced labor, prison labor, debt bondage, coerced marriage, coerced commercial exploits, and the exploitation of children. People who flee conflict, natural disasters, political regression, or migrate to seek work are also vulnerable. Then at the end, this is the trafficking and exploitation, how countries rank. The Global Slavery Index, which includes forced marriage, ranks North Korea the worst. More than one in 10 people are estimated to be in conditions of modern slavery. In Eritrea, about nine in 100 people are estimated to be modern slaves. About three in 100 people in Mauritania are slaves with fewer proportionally in Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Pakistan, and the United Arab Emir Emirates. About one in 100 people in Russia, Afghanistan, and Kuwait are in modern slavery. Over half of all people living in modern slavery are in G2O countries. And these countries help fuel enslavement by importing products and supplies reliant on forced labor. Among the GTO countries, India has 11 million people in modern slavery. China has 5.8 million people. Russia has 1.9 million people. Indonesia has 1.8 million. Turkey has 1.3 million. And the US has 1.1 million people. Human trafficking and forced labor are closer to home than many Americans think. The Global Slavery Index warns that migrant workers in the agricultural sector in the US and Canada are vulnerable to forced labor. The index cites the use of forced prison labor in American public and private prisons. Supply chains to the US market are also at risk of using forced labor, the report says. Some US visitors to the Caribbean help fuel sex tourism reliant upon the sexual exploitation and trafficking of minors. And the only thing I can add before I sign off is in the late 1990s, my son went to Thailand and he was offered to be taken to a brothel for his manhood. And my son said, I promised my mom I would be pure until I got married. And the woman, the mother figure is a very important and reverent 
person. So they did not force him. And later he told me that the father of the family he stayed with told me he really met some, missed some succulent 10, 11 and 12 year old girls. And now I'm turning this over to Betsy Wurzel. Hi everyone. Um, thank you, Lisa and Lillian for your information. This is just, takes my breath away of how mind boggling uh, all this information is. And I, there's so many comments um, uh, I need to make. Uh, what Lisa and Lillian are saying is very true. It is going on. I can tell you, and I don't even know how these perverts get my email, that I get emails every day of teenage girls advertising themselves. And I think to myself, where are these, where are they getting these young girls? And they are probably, most likely, part of the sex trade and human trafficking. It is disgusting. Um, Thailand, uh, Lily mentioned Thailand, is known for sex trafficking. Uh, rich people from all over go over there for young boys and girls. Um, it's enough to make me want to hurl, uh, to be honest. Also, um, and I don't mean to be preachy here, but I just, my Jersey girl's got to tell like it is. Parents, guardians, please watch what your children are doing on the internet. I can't say that enough. Do you know that some pedophile, some sex trafficker can Google your address and find out where you live? So all you girls that are strutting your stuff out on the social internet, guess what? There's predators looking and that can make you very prone to getting kidnapped and into the sex trade. And you might think, Betsy, you're off the wall. It has happened and it can happen. They look for this. Also, who is on the other side of that internet when you're playing games? They go on the dark web and they look for people. They look for young boys and girls who are having trouble at home. Um, <coughs> excuse me, they look for that. And they look for uh, boys and girls that are vulnerable. And um, I had mentioned before, probably a month or two ago, I did interview a ex uh, sex trafficker. And he told me, they do look for people who are vulnerable. They look for people on the internet. They look at Facebook. So be very careful about what you put on there and what you do on there because you can become a victim. Also, I want to talk about uh, Josh and I saw the movie Sound of Freedom. Now, I heard there's some controversy about it. I'm not going to get into that. If there's controversy about it, the message that the movie has is is out there. It's, it's so heart touching that these children, boys and girls are getting sold even as young as six years old because the value of how much they can be in the sex trade could be uh, for years. And they are sold all over the world. Well, you mentioned about the sex trade all over. Um, it's real folks. Human slavery is present there's more slaves now than there ever were. They are snatching up boys and girls. They do do their homework, as Lillian said. In the movie, Sound of Freedom, this uh, woman goes to a poor family and says, oh, you know, we're having this talent um, for modeling. You know, we're, we're interviewing people. So the father sends his daughter and son there and comes to pick them up. They're gone and they got sold. And it, it's really very uh, tragic and very sad. Parents, guardians, do not be on your phone 
when your children are running around the store? Because I see parents completely oblivious. Do you know it only takes a few seconds for someone to snatch your child? I was in a store not too long ago. So a nice looking little boy and girl, blonde hair, blue eyed, and the father's oblivious, shopping. All it would have taken would have been a couple of seconds for someone to scoop them up. Uh, and you might think, Betsy, you know, that doesn't happen today. Yes, it does happen. You have to be diligent. You have to be aware of your surroundings, like Lillian said. You have to watch your children. There's no excuse. You know what? The phone could wait. Pay attention to your children. In the park, they could go off. All a stranger has to do is say, hey, little boy, little girl, do you want to see a puppy? That they usually like to lure in that way for candy. Um, I told Josh, <laughs> I put the fear in him, folks. Uh, and I'm very uh, blunt. In no uncertain terms, I told Josh, don't you ever go up to a car. Don't you ever go into a car with the stranger. I will never see you again. And they will do things to you that you don't want to be done. And we were uh, downstairs at, um, in a mall and I went to get a coffee and Josh said to me, mom, this guy's making me feel uncomfortable. He's staring at me. And I looked over and the guy was staring at Josh, but Josh knew because I had talked to him and we moved somewhere else. Talk to your children, tell them about the dangers that are out there in society. And not that you want them to be afraid of strangers, but you have to be aware at all times where your children are, what they're doing, what's going on around you. And you won't know that if your face is glued to the phone. Now you might think I'm a little harsh. Well, I'm not gonna apologize for it because people need to wake up. You do not want to live with the fact that you were looking at your phone and your child was snatched. You don't wanna live with that guilt. So please be vigilant. Please watch what your children are doing on the internet. Get involved in your child's life. Look for signs. These um, predators, look for children who are abused at home also. The sex trafficker that I interviewed, his first um, victim was his girlfriend who was 14 years old, was being sexually abused at home. And so well, now you could get paid for it. You're doing it anyway. Why don't you get paid for it? So be very, very careful. Uh, older women, excuse me. <coughs> I see older women also strutting their stuff out there on the internet. You also can get kidnapped. You also can get sold. So just be mindful of what you're doing and ask yourself, is this safe? Should I be exposing my body? Hey, if you have a great shape, you got it. As I used to say, flaunt it. But now in this day and age, you can't be flaunting your stuff. You're going to attract a predator. Just like there's fish in the ocean, they attract the bigger prey, the predators. You're also going to attract a predator. And um, the technology is good. Technology is also could be unsafe. They can find where you live. That's the scary part. That's what I have to say today. Thank you for listening. And, um, you know, see what you could do to help. See what you could do to get involved. Thank you. Thank you all very much for listening to Lest We Can Get <laughs> hyphen historical with your host, Lisa Skinner, Betsy Wurzel, Lillian Caldwell. Our call to action today is contact the organizations that work with trafficking of children, of women and young boys. Sign up, bring the material in the fall to school. Get your local PTA or PPO involved. Form clubs where the kids are aware of stranger danger. It's just not a catchy little phrase. It exists. Teach your children 
how to protect themselves. If it's going to make you feel birdie, yes, have them learn basic Tai Chi or basic, I forget what it's called now, uh, karate. There are defense moves your children can learn because sometimes running away doesn't always work. Your kid may fall, they may stumble. They may be so frantic, they can't think. That happens to me. Your mind is going in all directions and you can't decide what you wanna do. And maybe there isn't a fire station for them to run to, or there's no traffic cop on the street. It's very rare now to see police officers out in the street, unless you live in a city. But at where I live in, in Reading, Pennsylvania, I don't see police officers. I see their cars passing by, but I don't see them standing at the corner. So it's not a simple world anymore, and it's only going to get more complicated. So that is my call to action. Lisa, please provide your email to the audience should they have any questions yes you can reach me at dementia whisperer and then the number one at gmail.com thanks again for listening today thank you and on september 19th lisa is going to be presenting a webinar on Alzheimer's revelations, what people need to know to survive having a, a loved one or those caregivers who are, care, who are caring for somebody with Alzheimer's disease and dementia, what you really need to know to help you through this plight. And if you're interested and want to attend, please, email Lisa Skinner, leave her your name, your email address with the note saying, yes, count me in and we will send you out an invitation to join. And Lisa will provide you with more information. Betsy, please provide your email. My email is Sloan, S-L-O-A-N, Betsy, B-E-T-S-Y 31 at gmail.com. I want to thank everyone for listening. And I want to highly recommend everyone, if you're a caregiver, and chances are, if you're not, you will be, to attend Lisa's seminar, webinar. Um, I know Lisa. I know she gives great information. And I wish there was something like that when I was caregiving. Um, because it's very important and education makes a world of difference uh, for the caregiver and for your loved one. So have a nice weekend, everyone, and thank you. And my address is PWR Network LLC at gmail.com. And I also want to announce if you like what you hear, unless we forget hyphen historical, and you feel like you could do a podcast yourself, may I suggest you go over to amazon.com or use this URL, https colon forward slash forward slash a period co forward slash d forward slash two small m capital x b a TP, and you can either purchase the paperback or you can purchase the hardcover and get your podcast voice heard around the world, like Betsy Wurzel with Chatting with Betsy and like Lisa Skinner on Truth, Lies, and Alzheimer's. Thank you all very much for listening. And remember, you can hear this 
video all over again on youtube.com forward slash PWR network underline PW talk radio and iTunes, iHeart, Twitter, LinkedIn, and of course on the website, https colon forward slash forward slash passionate world talk radio.com and have a great weekend.